seated. I want to ask you a question before we go on. What did we learn back in chapter number four? So today we started a new chapter, but, but what happened last week? What happened last time? Many of you guys will remember that the nation of Israel got whipped in a battle by the name of Ebenezer. And in this battle, a lot took place. So, for example, the, the main guy that was over the tabernacle, his name was Eli. He was the high priest during that time. Well, during this battle, he had two boys that were killed. Do you remember? Phineas and Hophni were their names. They were killed in the battle. Messenger comes back. Tells Eli, who had, over the course of his life, was just grown really fat and wayward and rebellious. He literally hears the news, falls backwards, break his, breaks his neck, and he dies. Now, during this battle, uh, some rogue Israelites thought that they would take the Ark of the Covenant of God without God's permission, without God's moving, take it into battle in hopes that they would win against the Philistines. But the Lord showed them that you have to do things by the book. Very quickly, they found out that they were in big trouble. Philistines end up defeating the Israelites, and the Ark of God was captured. It was taken away. But here we are in chapter 5, and so Scripture follows up and tells us what exactly happens with the Ark of, of God under the care of the Philistines. Now, you can imagine yourself as an Israelite during this time, hey, what's going to happen next? What happens when this artifact is taken by the enemy? Is it lost forever? What's going to become of the Ark of the Covenant? Is God now going to take His power and His presence along with the Ark of the Covenant and give it to Israel's enemies? So there's probably a lot swirling around within the Israelite mind at this point. But what you're about to see is that God didn't fall into the hands of the enemies. In fact, it's actually the opposite that takes place. The enemies fall into the heavy hand of God. You know, in the New Testament, the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 31, it says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And that's exactly what happened to the Philistines. Now, let's ask a question, number one this morning, as we approach this text. Are there any Philistines today? So again, we're talking about something that was written many, many years ago. But do you know why the Old Testament that was, was given to us? Do you know why God preserved the canon of Scripture? Do you know why God has the Old Testament sitting before us here in our laps? You see, Paul tells us that the events of the Old Testament happen in order to be an example for us. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 11, that it happened to them as an example it was written down for our instruction. The Old Testament is not obsolete. We have this passage before us this morning so that we can learn from their example. So here we find God's people living among a Philistine culture. Is that true for us today? Can we learn from their examples? Do we live before the face of a very secular culture? The answer to that question is yes. We do live in a Philistine culture today. Our world, like the world there of 1 Samuel, doesn't want to get rid of God altogether, much like the Philistines. They didn't want to just get rid of the Ark of the Covenant. In fact, look with me in your Bibles at chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. I'm going to read it again real quick. It says, When the Philistines captured the Ark of God, they brought it from Ebenezer, to Ashdod. Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it up beside Dagon. So what do they do? They, they capture the ark of the covenant. And what do they do next? Well, they don't destroy the ark. That's typically what enemies would do is to rummage and, and, and to basically tear things up. But that's not what the Philistines did. Instead, they take this Ark of the Covenant, they towed it into the temple of their God and basically just put this symbol of the presence of God on a shelf. Is basically and essentially what they did. Does that happen today? Yes. 
We live in a culture that doesn't want to just completely eradicate or to get rid of God. Instead, they just want to kind of take him and put him on the shelf next to their other false gods. We see this all the time in our culture. People want to add on Christianity. They want to add on a relationship with Christ like an accessory on their life. Hey, I've got my life and I just want to tack the Lord onto the end of it just whenever it's convenient. We see this all the time. Let me give you some practical examples of people wanting to just tack God on to just a small portion of their life. This is the reason why many times non-Christians have the desire to be married within a church. It kind of eases their conscience. You know, they don't want to fully submit to the God of Scripture, but they do want to have some sort of religious notion within their life. In many ways, we see this within our political system as well. Why is it that public officials swear on the Bible and use God's name when sworn into office, but then when they get into office, few officials actually believe in the authority of Scripture? The 66 books that we talked about earlier, the majority believe that the teachings of Scripture should be completely forbidden within civic life. Have you ever noticed there used to be a, I don't even know if it's still, it's called C-SPAN. Did any of you guys ever watch that? I'm glad you didn't. There's this channel on TV and it's just constant government official meetings, court and legislative sessions. Many times as a young boy I'd watch that. No, I don't even know why. There's so much better stuff to watch. But you would see different sessions open up with some sort of prayer. And they would always pray, it didn't matter which side of the aisle they were on, they would always pray that God would bless America. But you happen to, I happen to look back and to think that's the way civic life is still acting today. We see many people praying for God to bless America just as long as God doesn't try to tell anyone what to do. Again, trying to add religion, add Christ just as an accessory on their civic life. That's what's taking place in this passage. The Philistines are okay with God. They're going to bring in the Ark of the Covenant into the secular temple just as long as he will stay behind the Philistine God and and just as long as he'll stay quiet. Well, now, how number two, how does God handle the Philistines? Everything that's just happened, how does God respond? The Bible says in verse number three, And when the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and put him back in his place. This is exactly what happens every single time. When false gods are exalted before a holy God, he always humbles them in front of the eyes of a lost and dying world. God always humbles the idols of this world. Let me give you some examples just from 20th century and then moving into our era. Uh, So when we look at, just in particular, the false gods of the early 20th century. So think with me for just a second. Think about the early 20th century. We see the end of the 19th century. How did it end? You guys remember? You look back just not really that long ago here in America, what was going on? Man began to get very confident, especially here in America. Man become very arrogant. He begins to learn much about science. He begins to fill his head with, with knowledge. It was an age of what we call humanism. Man was evolving into this sort of self-made, self-glorifying paradise. He thought, man, we can achieve, we can achieve anything. We've seen a lot of innovation take place. And so what happens then is man becomes confident in himself and he puts religion on the shelf. It became a man himself become that false god. He becomes sort of this Dagon, like what we read here in 1 Samuel. So what does the Lord do? He exposes man. He begins to show man how actually weak he is. You guys remember what took place in 1912? Do you remember the big boat, the Titanic? See if you guys learned about this or 
Remember reading the story? The Titanic was the ultimate naval achievement. In fact, it was a ship that according to its designer, not even God could sink. What happened to it? It sank in the cold North Atlantic. People on the boat were enjoying themselves. They're just really priding themselves in what man can do. That event shook up the worldview of modernity, of the modern man. People began to think, okay, we put a lot of confidence in this, and now it's saying. But as time, as time passed on, God literally puts the false god of that culture down on the ground, exposes its weakness, but over time, here comes man, and he begins to set that false idol back up. We fast forward from 1912 to 1914. The war that everyone said was impossible began. In World War I, it was just a real terrible, it was a very bloody war. But then modern man comes along. You remember the same modern man that said, hey, we're advancing. We're past all of this fighting. The modern man comes along and he declared it to be the war to end all wars. So they try to set that Dagon, that false god, back up. Again, trying to put man back up in what they thought he needed to be viewed as. Over time, as we continue to progress past 1914, we see God continuing to humble man. And what does people continue to do? Like the Philistines here in this passage, they refuse to repent. They continue to set their idols back where they think they belong. Look with me what happens here in the text in verse number 4. Chapter 5, verse 4 says, But when they rose early on the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both his hands were lying cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. So again, this is warrior context that's going on here. Typically, in warrior culture, when you defeated the enemy, what are you going to do? You're going to, off, you're going to cut off its head. So in like manner, verse number 4, Dagon had been conquered. It had been slain by the God of Israel's ark. God cuts off its head, but not only that, cuts off its hands. In ancient culture, that was this sort of trophy of victory. But then, in fact, in verse number 5, the Bible goes on to tell us that years and years later, Philistines would still remember the, de the defeat of their false god. I'll read it. It says, this is why the priests of Dagon and all who enter the house of Dagon do not tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod to this day. What did the Lord do? He threw down on the, the Philistine God. In like manner, as we are reminded of American culture, God has and will continue to smash the false idols within our culture and within our heart. As we think about the 20th century, I want to continue to build history here as well. We ask, what, what happens after uh, God smashes some of the idols of the 20th century? What about our era? What about the time in which we live? Some of us, all of us, most of us, were not around during the Titanic. We weren't around during World War I. So what, how is God smashing the idols within our culture? What does that look like? So when we move past that era of the Titanic, we call that modernity, we have now moved into an era called post-modernity. That's the culture in which you and I live today. We no longer worship humanism. We no longer worship science. We no longer worship education like they used to. So what is the false god of our era here in post-modernity? Now, as I study and the more research I do, the more people I talk to, many people believe that the false gods in which are really in our culture today stem back to a center of thought that was really born out of what we call the sexual revolution in the 1960s and in the 1970s. Now let me, let me explain to you why I think that's legitimate. What happened during the 1960s 
in the 1970s that have set up so many false gods within our culture today. You see, Americans decided during the 1960s and the 1970s to put the Bible on the shelf and then begin to write their own rules about sex, marriage, and even about gender. That's what took place in the 60s and 70s. They said, you know, I know what the book says, but we're just going to do whatever feels right or whatever we want to do. What was the result of people putting God on the shelf and setting up their own, really, this big form of idolatry? Homes were broken. The divorce rates in the 60s and 70s begin to skyrocket. We have the spread of sexual violence. You have the spread of, of pornography. And so people since that time have begun to openly advocate for homosexuality and other sexual-related deviances away from what the Bible says is true and right and holy. So again, we have these false gods that are set up all within our culture, especially here in America. How is God exposing those false, those false idols of the sexual revolution? You see, as American culture was beginning to grant acceptance to these perversions, the very things that Leviticus 18 talks about and the very things that Leviticus 20 calls abominations, this mysterious virus begins to appear on the scene here that begin to spread death through sexually promiscuous behavior. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. So as this mysterious disease begins to spread throughout America, as God uses this to judge, did this spread widespread repentance? As people begin to see the error of their way, they're facing physical consequences, did they turn back to the Lord? No. You know who they look to? They look to science. Instead of looking to God's moral reforms in Scripture that would have practically wiped out AIDS if they would just listen to what the Bible says, they look to science. We should take note of this. That when our false gods have fallen, when God comes along and and wakes us up and says, hey, no, don't put your trust in this thing. We should repent and seek the grace of God because He is the one that makes all false gods to fall. This is, you know, I give the example of our culture today, but it doesn't just happen in secular culture. False gods are set up even within evangelical circles, even within churches. Many people promote a pastor over than the Word of God. And we've seen this very recently in the fall of a, a very prominent, reformed, Bible-preaching Bible teacher. I'm not going to drop his name this morning, but it wouldn't be hard to find out who he is. The point is, so many times we begin to worship other things and follow other people besides Christ. And that's a great danger even within churches. Man is susceptible to fall. Again, we don't want to say, okay, yeah, I'll worship the Lord, but I'm also going to follow this guy, and I'm also going to put my hope in this. Or No, our hope should be fully in Christ. It's a great warning to us this morning, which leads us to our third point. Notice God's heavy hand. God not only slays the idols that are set up against him, he also judges those who worship and serve those false idols. Look with me in your Bibles at verse number 6. The Bible says, The hand of the Lord was heavy against the people of Ashdod, and he terrified and afflicted them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. And when the men of Ashdod saw how things were, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is hard against us and against Dagon our God. So Dagon, this false god, its hands are literally cut off. But that wasn't the case for the Lord. Where is his hands? Heavy upon the people. That's what's taking place. 
But how is God's hand heavy upon these people? What's going on here? The Bible talks about how they're afflicted. They're experiencing what we know now as the bubonic plague. What does that mean? The word tumors here is speaking generally to swellings and to growth. Uh, all kinds of nasty growths on their body, which makes sense contextually. If you go look, Emily and I have been watching this thing on Answers in Genesis, and I can't even, I can't even remember the name of it right now, but there's five episodes out talking about First and Second Samuel, and it's really rich. But, but when you see where the Ark of the Covenant would have went, it's right on the coast which makes sense for the bubonic plague. It's a disease that was common in coastal regions. Why? Because it was spread by mice, it was spread by rats from ships that came in on ships. How do we know this? Well, I'm not just making this up about the bubonic plague. I'm not just making this up about mice and rats. In fact, look on down to the next chapter. We'll be looking at next week. Look in 1 Samuel chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Again, here's a connection between the mice and the tumors and the rats, all this. Chapter 6, verse 4 says, And they said, What is the guilt offering that we shall return to him? They answered, Five golden tumors and five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines. For the same plague was on all of you and on all your lords, so you must make images of your tumors, the images of your mice that ravage the land, and give glory to the God of Israel. Perhaps he will lighten his hand from off you and your gods and on your land. So again, that's not the main emphasis of this text, so I can't spend a lot of time there, but I think there is a significance. It's important for us to, to point out. All right, let's keep plowing. Go back to chapter 5, verse number 8. The Bible says in chapter 5, verse number 8, So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they answered, let the ark of the God of Israel be brought around to Gath. So what they do? They begin, to, they begin to notice that, they begin to pinpoint the reason for their affliction. They know God has gotten their attention. So the Philistines agreed to, to move the ark to a place called Gath. They thought, well, maybe this is just local circumstances. We're breaking out. Maybe we've ate a bad taco. I don't know. Let's just go ahead and send it on down the road. But the same thing happens in Gath. Look at verse number 9. But after they had brought it around, the hand of the Lord was against the city, causing a very great panic, and he afflicted the people of the city, both young and old, so that tumors broke out on them. <laughs> Does it stay there? No, the Bible tells us it goes on to move to Ekron. But the people immediately rebelled. The Bible says in verse number 10, they have brought around to us the ark of the God of Israel to kill us and our people. So again, we see God's heavy hand was universal and it was constant against false worshipers. It wasn't just regional. It wasn't just local. It happened to everyone. Now, let's go on down to verse number 11. Because so I want to spend the rest of our time here in a minute talking about our application it says in verse 11, They sent therefore and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of, of the God of Israel and let it return to its own place that it may not kill us and our people. For there was a deathly panic throughout the whole city. The hand of God was very heavy there. The men who did not die were struck with tumors and the cry of the city went up to heaven. So again, what's going on here? When we read this story, I don't want you to, to think, well, this is just a secluded historical incident. When someone worshipped a false god, that's what happened in the Old Testament. God doesn't care now how we worship. That's what many preachers would tell you, but that's, that's not the truth of God's word. God is warning us in this passage of his judgment to all nations, to all people, in all time. When we worship things falsely, then comes judgment. It's going to happen. I had something I was going to share. Discernment has led me otherwise. 
Uh, let's move on to our next point, point number four, and that's this. I'm going to head towards application. Why today are Christians walking around defeated? Like God's people in the Old Testament, like the Israelites, that's what's going on. They were walking around defeated by the Philistines. It's meant, this story is meant to teach us. This story was meant to teach not only Israel, it's meant to teach the new Israel. It's meant to teach the church. What's God trying to teach us here in this passage? What we need to understand is the root. We need to understand the cause of defeat. Why does the Christian experience defeat in their life? Why is that? Here in this story, the Christians were defeated, but we see it wasn't because of the power of the enemy, because the enemy was on its face before a holy God. The cause of weakness in the life of a Christian, the, the cause of defeat in the life of not only a Christian, but a church and a nation or, or fill in the blank of whatever it is, the cause of defeat is the condition of our relationship with the Lord. Why did Israel go through all of this? Why did the Philistines go through all of this? Because of their condition, because of the condition of their relationship with God. Why were they defeated in the days of Eli? It was because the people forgot about the Lord. It's because they distanced themselves away from God and away from His Word. Same is true in your life. I want everybody to listen to me. You walk around as a defeated Christian who carries around the name of Christ and you're still indulging in sin. Do you know why that is? It's because likewise you have forgotten about God. You have distanced yourselves from God and His Word. Have you noticed the closer and nearer you draw to Christ, the more He has your affections, the less sin there is in your life? When you pursue holiness, it is so much easier to, to just restrain from sin in a power that's granted through His Holy Spirit. But these people in this passage, they forgot God. They drifted away from God and then end up offending God and, def and then falling prey to the enemy, to the Philistine army. The same thing happens to churches and individuals today. Let me give you a modern day example in which day after day I see so many Christians living in defeat. And it's sad, but it's the, rea the reality of the state of the church. A modern day example of defeat is found in the struggle of men and women in setting things before their eyes that is sinful, that is not holy and pure and of God. Numerous surveys, survey after survey, reveals and it shows that a majority of men are practically addicted to sinful indulgences, mainly by means of internet websites. These same surveys show us that professing Christians and even pastors are addicted to, to images at rates similar to those of non-believers. So again, surveys show believers and non-believers are those who profess to be believers. Statistically, it's about the same now. So what do people say whenever you begin to bring up defeat in the life of Christians, those who are struggling with this particular sin? We hear people say, well, the temptation's too strong. Things are just so much more accessible now. And what people are really saying is this, what can an Israelite man do in the face of a mighty Philistine? That's basically what they're contextually saying. But what's the solution? What's the solution for those who, like Israel, are actively living in defeat? The answer is exactly what I told you a few minutes ago. It's to remember God. If you're living in a season of defeat, remember God. We turn to God. We turn to Him for His power. That He may grant us the ability to repent. We bathe our hearts and our minds in the glory of God through His Word. I'm telling you, 
men of God need to get on their knees and ask God to cleanse them of their sins and to make them holy. In a very practical way, men, women, whoever you are, you have to understand that the mind controls the heart. So that like, you're actively engaged daily in warfare. You have to think things that... You have to set your mind on the things of God. If you're not setting your mind on the things of God, you're going to give in to the lust of the flesh. So it means discipline. It means engaging in the spiritual disciplines. Because if not, that fertile ground in your heart that God's cultivated will begin to sprout up weeds that rob the soul of its nourishment and growth. You wonder why you're not growing it's because you just let whatever come in and sow seeds. You watch whatever you want on TV. You let your kids watch whatever they want on TV. It's just free reign in your home. And it's not right and it's not helpful. But a Christian man who is walking close to the Lord, whose faith is active, whose faith is actively empowered by the Holy Spirit through God's word and prayer, a man who's actively engaged in a supportive community within the local church. Those type of men and women are not easily overcome by the things of the flesh, the things of this world. God's given us good precept. He's given us good, His good word. And He calls us to stop the sinful habits of the Philistine world. You may say, well, the enemy is strong, okay, but not stronger than God. What, what does the Bible tell us? 1 John 4, 4 says, He who is greater in you is greater than he who is in the world. Again, there's going to be people undeniably after church will say, oh yeah, I feel convicted over my sin, but you just don't understand. The times are different. Do you know who the Apostle Paul wrote to? He wrote to a, a culture that had access to sinful pleasures, just as our culture does. Things in the culture that Paul lived were as tolerable as things are today. Homosexual relationships, all this stuff, was just as prevalent during Paul's time as it is today. Do you know what he said to them? Those people kept throwing up excuses we don't understand. Paul says this in Romans chapter 6, verse number 11. If you come on Sunday nights, you would have already heard this. The Bible says, You also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law but under grace. As you begin to submit to Christ's lordship and set your mind on the things of God, one battle at a time, one decision at a time, as you begin to follow Christ and, and submit to his lordship, what will happen is increase liberty from the dominion of sin. You say no, and it begins to kill that sin in your life. You have a decision. God is greater and He's more powerful than the sin that's seeking to destroy your life and your testimony. And guess what? We have this hope. One day, you and I, if you are in Christ, will reach the glories of heaven. And at that moment, there will be no more temptation. We will experience true freedom from sin and the flesh. We'll shed this earth suit of flesh and sin and we'll be there with Christ forever. All right. What's God's message for the Philistine world today? That's our last point. In this story, God is teaching us, number one, that He is the living God. The Philistines, when they looked at a God, they saw a God as an object. It was something they cut or they carved. You know what happened in God's people? They fell into that same mindset when they put confidence in the ark. The ark was just a symbol. It wasn't really God. They needed to understand that God's not something that can be moved or manipulated or controlled. He's in an object in which 
you take and you put on a shelf and then you just go take it off whenever it's convenient. That's not the way God works. God's still the same as he was in Old Testament times. In fact, the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse number 10, it says the Lord is the true God. He is a living God and the everlasting King. So today, what have you learned about God? You understand that he is living. He's not somebody that you just pull out when it's convenient, like this cosmic vending machine. Put in the right combination, you get what you want. That's not the way God works. Not only is he a living God, number two, he's the only true God. There is no other God but the one true God. He has an exclusive status. He is the only one. In Exodus 20, verses 2 and 3, the Bible says, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. You have to understand something about the God of Scripture, the only true God. He will not stand for someone to just kind of move over a little bit so that he can sit on the shelf with them. That's not the way it works with the Lord. He demands exclusive sovereignty over our life. It's not as though your affections belong over here and there. No, he deserves them all. He will not share his reign with idols. He will, like this story, throw them down. God demands that all things submit to his sovereignty. He demands that presidents submit to his sovereignty. He demands that economies submit to his authority. He demands that fighter jets submit to his authority. Microscopes, every single thing in all of creation, God demands that they submit to his supreme and sovereign authority. Isaiah 46 verse number 9 says this, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. What does that mean practically for your heart this morning? God will not share His sovereignty within your heart with fame, with possessions, with pride. None of those things. He demands to completely rule your heart. The third thing we learn about this living and true God is that He is powerful and mighty. You see, when Israel's enemy approached, what did God do? <laughs> he surely and swiftly crushed. That's what he does. That's the way he works with false gods. There's zero percent of withstanding God's judgment on your own. Every rebel, every false god will be crushed under the heavy hand of his might. And last, number four, and this is where we need to land, God reveals himself as a saving God. So we read this story about the Ark of the Covenant being captured. God allowed himself via the Ark to fall into the hands of the enemies. Why? Why would God allow that? God allowed himself via the Ark to be captured by the enemies so that he could better save Israel. Now, this story that we read about the ark being captured is just a preview of an even greater salvation that is played out in the New Testament. You see, God would later send his son into the world. And what happened with his enemies? Jesus surrendered himself to his enemies. There was no fighting. He did not strike them with his heavy hand, as like the Old Testament. Instead, what did Christ do? Christ yielded himself through death on a cross. You remember the story we read here in 1 Samuel? God's enemies were subject to the plague. You remember us talking about that? Well, the plague and the judgment that should have fell on us as enemies of God fell on Jesus instead. Romans chapter 5, verse number 8 says this, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I want you to understand this morning as we head towards our invitation. As God convicts you to repent of your sins, as God exposes idols in your life, maybe it's good things, but they're taking place of the supreme good in Christ. So maybe it's work. Maybe you're tempted to give all your time and all your affections, all your energy to work. 
and work has become that idol in your life. My encouragement to you, as God prompts you through His Spirit, is to repent of that. And then begin to look at what Scripture says about work. Work is a good thing given by God, but it has to fall into the right priorities. Maybe it's the good gift that God has given to a man and a woman. But somewhere along the way, you've taken that good gift and you've twisted it and perverted it and made it all about you. You've made an idol out of it. That's what you worship. That's what you're always thinking about. That's what's consumed your life. You're living in defeat. Well, there are many here this morning that that probably need to surrender to Christ for the first time in their life. And so that's what I would encourage you to do, to to completely submit to God's rule and reign in your heart as as, as He is sovereign King. But there may be Christians in this room that for some reason there's different struggles in your life. Maybe it's pride. Maybe it's how you interact with your family. Maybe it's your anger. Maybe it's this or that. Again, my encouragement to you is as God prompts you, submit, confess, and repent. Because you know what's going to happen in due time? God's prompting you now. But there will be a time in your life when God does smash that false God, when he does expose it. And my prayer as one of your pastors is that he would smash those false gods sooner rather than later, while your heart's still tender. I invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. Lord, I ask you.